clearly that uh, it made it very, very easy for the president to declare a national emergency. Well, rather quietly, they, they changed it again and sort of reversed that to a degree. But I think it's a non-event because, you know, I think there's so many other excuses. I mean, how many times you hear the president say, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to go to the Congress, you know, to get permission. I, I have permission under such and such statute. Uh, I'm the commander in chief. I'm the decider. I can do this tomorrow. And, you know, there was something on television last night, once again, refreshing our memories about, uh, I think Baker was on. It was a history program. But I remember how annoyed I was in 1990 that, yeah, we, we have the authority. We have the authority to go into the Persian Gulf. Uh, but uh, uh, we'll ask Congress anyway. But we have the authority, we'll go, but we'll do it uh, because they got the authority from the United Nations, you know, stuff, stuff like that. So uh, sometimes, uh, even if, the, if you have a few people over there and it gets changed, it's, you know, all, I think all government boils down to the character of the people that are in office. You know, it's good to have a constitution, it's good to try to hold them uh, to it. But uh, if, if the in individuals have no character, then there's, there's uh, not much hope. People ask about how do you get rid of the influence of the special interests. Well, if we had only men of character and women of character, uh, just ignore the uh, pressures of the, of the special interests. They say, well, we need to pass laws against lobbyists coming to Washington. I said, well, that's, that's, not going, that's not going to do it. But ultimately, if you don't want influence by powerful special interests, whether it's foreign policy or domestic, is you have to make the government completely different. The government should be there uh, for one reason, to protect liberty and not to run our lives, run the economy, or police the world. That is the kind of government I advocate. How did it all start? Almost everyone has heard of the United States Constitution, but how many people who call themselves U.S. citizens really know what the original intent of the founders was? What necessities, what dreams, what intentions led to this magnificent country, the United States of America? How did it all start? And how can so many go about their daily lives with not the slightest concern that it may not go on forever? What is it in human nature that causes people to take for granted the very fundamentals that are responsible for their happy state of affairs? Fundamentals that, if removed, will cause that slow or quick decline experienced by so many once strong nations throughout history. Let's talk to a few citizens and see how much they understand about the document Ben Franklin and the Founding Fathers created at the dawn of this nation. What is the U.S. Constitution? It's a documentary that allowed white people who owned property to vote. The U.S. Constitution is the document that basically outlines our rights as citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, thought up by Mr. Hamilton, Madison, and Jay. Oh, it's the, the document uh, basically describing the overall structure of what, what we consider the laws of our land. The dictionary defines constitute as follows. All of the definitions in this word point to what a constitution is, but four words are repeated two or three times. These words are form, set, establish, and make. Well, the word establish actually appears a number of places in the Constitution, but if you're talking about the preamble, we the people of the United States do hereby ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States. It refers to the creation of the government. Ordain is a legal term, essentially means that we, the people, have the power to pass this law and establishes the actual setting up of something that didn't exist prior to the Constitution being ratified. The words found and frame are also present and these words closely parallel the spirit of the repeated words. 
But if this is what it means to constitute something, what is a constitution? The U.S. Constitution is the agreement between the people designed, you know, at the founding of this country. It is the, the compass that should lead the nation along the path of freedom and liberty for the individual. The United States Constitution is the supreme law of the land, as it ex itself says. Although it derives, of course, from the Declaration of Independence, which states uh, a set of higher principles, if you will, that guide interpretation of the Constitution. The Constitution it governs the way we live. Yeah, yeah, she's, yeah, she's right. So let's go over this again. We, the people, established the U.S. government. We established the United States. The people, through a charter, a document, called the Constitution, gave birth to this entity we now call the United States of America. This entity is managed by people we now call the government. We the people means that the people are supposed to be in charge and not the government, and that uh, the powers come from the people. Uh, they don't naturally fall to the government in any natural way. Uh, they get there because the people grant those powers in, in a very, in a very uh, limited fashion. And uh, once again, I think that's the part that we have forgotten too much, that uh, it seems like it is now that we the people means we the people in Washington who run your life and control your money. And that's where we've gotten uh, off base. Thus, under the authority of we the people, the Founding Fathers drafted up a set of principles that aligned with the principles in an earlier document known as the Declaration of Independence. The Constitution was thus established upon these combined principles. Today, we the people continue to breathe life into that which was established by our ancestors. That is to say, the original inhabitants colonial people who declared their independence from Britain established this system and they established it for, for a certain geographical jurisdiction. So anyone who comes within that geographical jurisdiction has to accept the existence of this set of laws just as if you come into my home you may have to accept the customs in my home. If you come into my business you may have to accept the terms and conditions on which my business is run. So long as there's no superior authority to tell me that I can't do it that way. And of course, there is no superior authority of the Constitution of the United States within our legal system. The significance of we the people, as it was written into the founding documents of the United States, was that the power of the government was coming from the people being handed to the government. And that the people, we the people, were the supreme authority. They were the source of the sovereignty. They were the ones that were creating the government, and the government was to be subject to their will. That was quite a different experience in the course of history, because prior to that, all governments were the other way around. That the governments were formed by the kings and, and the conquerors, and then they said, oh yeah, well, by the way, now that we've got ourselves in charge here and we've got everything under control, let's see about the people. Maybe we'll think about the people. What rights are we going to give the people? What benefits will we give the people to keep them from revolting or whatever? But it was always the top down until the United States Constitution was written, and all of a sudden it was from the bottom up. We the people were instituting that government. That's an interesting flip. The Constitution is a document used to enforce law on government, a document designed to limit government rather than limit citizens, as laws usually do. The Constitution was written to limit the size and scope of government. It was to uh, recognize that government was there to protect our liberties. The government would be very much smaller. It does not endorse the welfare system at all and doesn't endorse the uh, idea that we are the policemen of the world and we should occupy other countries. So instead of a government now that uh, occupies so many other countries and we have 700 bases overseas, that wouldn't happen if we had the proper size government. The government would be much, much smaller. Maybe maybe 80 percent smaller if we just followed the Constitution. It's important to realize that the government did not give birth to the United States. We, the people, did. More specifically, our ancestors. When they were 
we the people living at the time did. Unfortunately, the system has changed. Every year, incrementally, so slowly and so, so in such small little steps that you could hardly see it. The, the fulcrum has gradually tipped back the other way and now we have reverted back to the old world style of government where, where the government is in charge and we the people are being told what to do by the government. And that's a situation that is very sad in my mind and it's more than sad, it's very dangerous and we had better change it or else we're going to wind up in abject slavery. So, what is the U.S. government? What's its job? Its hat? Um, gosh, I, don't, I can't think about what it is. I can't, like, I'm trying to think. I mean, I know what it is, but I'm, do you know what the role of the federal government is? Not really. Uh, it changes according to, you know, your times. Uh, uh, the document was, was written with the idea that the government would be subservient to it. I believe that it was more outlining a federalist type of of, um, of structure. It's pretty well spelled out. All we have to do is read the federalist papers. I think we want to get would get back to the idea of federalism of the states as laboratories, where if you want to make one decision in Manhattan about you know pornography and triple X movies, you make it. You want to make another decision in Utah, you make that there. We decide in Virginia. And most laws would be decided at the state level. We would be one nation and one people, but we would have a more diverse country politically rather than have the politics the federal government imposed upon the nation. And I think you would have a, a much more peaceful country because if people didn't like it in New York, they can move uh, to Virginia. They can move to Utah, they can move to Mississippi, they can move where they're comfortable. When the Founding Fathers ratified the Constitution, wasn't their intention to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for a common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty, not only for themselves, but for their children as well? Are we doing this? We're supposed to be the future. It pays off everyone's debt. Well, I'm not paying off everyone's debt. I don't even believe in debt. You better or you're gonna hell, Pierce. See, you all that swearing from TV. Let's take a look at the issues confronting our country and the world and see how an application of the Constitution might be able to undo some of the knots we've tied ourselves up in. Values. There's that word again. Like inflation or loss of purchasing power. Words and phrases we have heard endlessly. But do we really know what the word values means? When people use the word values in society, I think generally they're talking about the definition of their culture. What is the predominant religious view? What is their view of justice? Every culture has its own little set of rules and regulations, the ethics of that culture. Many of them overlap, but you'd be surprised as you travel around the world how divergent some of those elements can be. Uh, for example, in, in the United States and in the Western world, the idea of monogamous marriage is just it's a value. It's, uh, it's a very important value, but there are parts in the world where 
a man is entitled, in fact, an obligation to have more than one wife, especially if there's a woman that needs to be provided for. Her husband has died and she's on the street to take her in as a second wife and so forth. And, and Americans are horrified at that idea because they're all tied up with this question of sexuality and they don't realize that in other cultures it's got very little to do with sexuality at all. It has to do with family unit and, and supporting people in need and so forth. So each culture has its values. That's not to say that we're supposed to have the view that all cultures are equal. I think we're entitled to be uh, biased in this sense. I think most of us, in, regardless of what culture we're in, we're entitled to think that our culture is the best. But in Western civilization, certainly in the United States, we have a set of values that has served us well and has, has created a great civilization. So are values relative or are they absolute? The way this question is answered may determine how much war a nation will tolerate. Are you saying, saying yeah. it's relative? Well, whenever someone tells me that all values are relative, I always ask them, are you absolutely sure of that? I mean, if you don't start from some point, whether you're doing a scientific experiment or you're running a political system, that's, this, this is the zero point. This is the cross of the XYZ axis on the graph. You're lost. Now, it may be some of those points are arbitrary, maybe some of those points can't be proven, and maybe some of those points really doesn't make a difference whether we pick this one or that one, but you better be sure of where you are before you take the next step. It seems values have the ability to instill useful ideas into people. Ideas like borrowing money for consumption is wrong, balancing budgets is right, war is wrong. Why is this? A true nation is a moral community. Uh, it shares things in value. It is, it is a, an extended family. And if they do not share similar values and convictions about what is right and wrong and good and evil, and they're disagreed on these fundaments, it ceases to be a community. And if it's not a community, it's not going to be a real country. And in a crisis, it will come apart. A, a great challenge is why are people good and how are they good? I mean, if we can solve the problem of human virtue, we really solve the problem of statism, of a government itself. The government is intended to solve the problem of evil, fundamentally, and if you count fraud in that category, it's still the same sort of thing. The degree to which we can make people good of their own free choice, of their own free will, is the degree to which we, we, we need government less. Welcome to today's world, a situation that may have started in 1962 with a Supreme Court case of Engel versus Vital. In this case, it seems the people unwittingly allowed their government to violate the First Amendment, which states, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the exercise thereof, end quote. From this, it's clear. The Founder's original intent was for the government to take a neutral position with respect to religion. Government was not to favor anyone's religion or prohibit anyone's religion. For instance, when Engel and others such as Abington Township v. Shemp and Stone v. Graham progressively outlawed both prayer and the Ten Commandments from the schools between 1962 and 1980, the Supreme Court may have misinterpreted the Constitution as it removed just about the only source of values children were getting in the nation's schools at the time. This is not to say that the only source of values is the Ten Commandments. This action seriously invalidated the need for values in civilized society. Thus, is it any wonder there continues to be so much antisocial behavior on school campuses? Behavior many feel is choreographed by the endless parade of Hollywood values? I'm going to tell the electrician to give it to you slow and easy, wise guy. And why are so many children coming from broken homes these days? 25 years of my time and for what? Could it be because so many children, now parents themselves, are clueless about the values that make a marriage work? The whole public school movement came out of an anti-American movement in the beginning from Dewey and the others who propagated it. 
uh, anti-American in this sense. We say anti the values of the Founding Fathers because the values of the Founding Fathers and the values of the biblical principles of Jews and Christians is that we should, uh, parents are responsible for the education of their children. Now, parents, when they're responsible, want them to be filled with uh, faith and values uh, and also knowledge, which has been taken away from them. Uh, the public school movement was a socialist movement. It produced uh, children that have become more and more enamored of the state as being their primary source of, uh, of uh, values. And it's uh, produced uh, uh, a degrading of their, not only their level of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, uh, but a degrading of their values. One of the key reasons people flocked to the New World was to be able to practice values through the religion of their choice, or no religion at all, without government prohibition. Unfortunately, the 1980 case of Stone v. Graham symbolized the start of the demise of all values in the public school system when the Ten Commandments were banned. With this event, we, as a society, may have opened the door to a society devoid of all values, whether originating in the Judeo-Christian tradition or any other tradition. We have allowed the Supreme Court to improperly interpret the original intent of the founders when we allowed them to systematically eradicate values from society in the name of diversity and equality. So what has happened is the Supreme Court has usurped all this power over the states and the people and been imposing its views and values on the states and on the people. But there's a weapon in the Constitution left there by the Founding Fathers, Article 3, Section 2, whereby Congress can tell the Supreme Court, stay out of this area, you have no authority here. It can restrict the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court by simple majority vote of both houses and the signature of the President. But Congress is too cowardly to confront the court, even though it has the power to do it. Not enough Americans are aware of this power, which is right in there. We do have a weapon to deal with the Supreme Court, a legal and constitutional weapon, and it is a dereliction of duty on the part of the Congress and President that they have never used it. It suggests that they are not serious in fighting the culture war. Abetted by incessant indoctrination from the corporate media, the Hollywood-based U.S. motion picture industry, crops of PhDs, Juris Doctorates, and MDs in academia, it is now politically correct to equate values with religion, and thus treat both as diseases, their practitioners lepers. Again, the founders wanted government to be neutral on the issue of religion. They did not want a society without values or religion. If you're talking about values relating to the United States Constitution, my experience has been that there is very little taught about the Constitution beyond uh, what would I call the mechanistic way it works. How are people elected to Congress? Uh, here's the president, here are the courts, this is what they do. And, but very little emphasis seems to be laid on the basic principles of the Constitution. Why is it structured this way? What was the purpose that the Founding Fathers had in mind? On what basis did they choose this structure as opposed to other structures? They had a pretty good structure, comparatively speaking, in the English system. And that knowledge, knowledge of the principles of the Constitution, is really what's necessary for people to apply it. So it seems values are extremely important. After all, if citizens can't differentiate between wise and foolish courses of action, they will fail to act appropriately on such things as energy policy, but also on even more serious issues. For instance, upon what criterion could citizens agree that it was necessary to go to war? Surely a nation full of citizens with no common values would be confused. They may be totally free, but their confusion will make them short-lived, if not barbaric. And many civilizations prior to the United States were barbaric. That's why the American experiment is so important. That's why the rudiments that made America happen must be preserved. Thus, applying and defending the values implied in the Constitution 
are, in essence, a matter of survival. For if these factors are dropped out, you get a cruel, chaotic, and revengeful society. Such a society will eventually occupy its time with pleasure-seeking hedonism, material acquisition, and violence-oriented pastimes. Hey, welcome to today's United States. No surprise, the baby boomers are in charge now. The United States has undergone a cultural, moral, and religious revolution. And a militant secularism has arisen in this country. It's always had a hold on the intellectual and academic elites. But in the 1960s, it captured the young in the universities and the colleges. And we had this great battle cultural war begin then nationally. And since then, if you will, secularism has, has really achieved dominance in the academic community and in the intellectual community and in the entertainment community in Hollywood, uh, among part of the, uh, the political community, but not the nation as a whole. However, it is much stronger than it was, and so this is the basis of the great cultural war we're undergoing uh, right now. And this militant, it is an anti-Christian, anti-God, anti-traditionalist revolution. It's partly a, the sexual revolution has a lot to do with it and how people live. And so we are two countries now. We are two countries morally and socially and culturally and theologically. And cultural wars do not lend themselves to peaceful coexistence. One side prevails or the other prevails. And the truth is that while the conservatives, in my judgment, we won the Cold War with political and economic communism. We've lost the cultural war with cultural Marxism, which I think has prevailed pretty much in the United States, or is now the dominant culture, whereas those of us who are traditionalists, we are, if you will, the counterculture. What exactly is cultural Marxism, the dominant culture of today? How did the founders of communism figure out a way to take over our country, not with guns and weapons, but with values and ideas? Let's take a closer look at this and see exactly how it happened. There was a man named Karl Marx. Marx got an idea. His idea was that the workers of the world should unite and rise up to counter an evil foe that foe being capitalism. Capitalism, the idea that people and private companies should be able to own the means of production and be free to earn and have as much as they wished was anathema to Marx. Marx felt the state should own the means of production as well as products produced and then the state should distribute a fair share of all such products to each and every worker. Thus, in his book, The Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx thundered, Workers of the World Unite! Sure that he had a principle to unify all workers in every country, Marx looked forward to eventually taking over the world. Karl Marx believed that you would have uh, a rebellion by the workers uh, against uh, the capitalist system, which would then create uh, a Marxist uh, communist society where you would have dictatorship of the proletariat. Unfortunately, when World War I broke out, the workers of the world did not unite. In fact, the workers united with their respective countries and fought each other. What happened was the Marxists had an enormous disillusionment when the French and the Germans and the British workers all rose up for the fatherland and went to war happily fighting one another. Marx's idea was a total failure. Workers were more loyal to their respective countries, churches, and cultural values than they were to their counterparts in other countries. They did not want to give up their houses, their cars, their stoves, their products. They did not want to have a classless society. Uh, they did not uh, vote and they didn't even have an overthrow. Some years after Marx failed, 
several of his disciples got a new idea on how to take over the world. One of his disciples, Antonio Gramsci, while, where else but in prison, wrote up a series of plans, now known as the prison notebooks. In this plan, Gramsci announced, the workers of the world will unite only after the long march is over. The long march? In other words, they had to get into the culture and change the way of people's thinking. And if people were thinking about patriotism and nation and God and country, that was a mechanism which was too resistant to Marxism. It could never take hold. So you had to erode and destroy that in the individuals. That began what's called the long march through the institutions, through the seminaries, through the churches, through the media, through Hollywood, and all the rest of it to create an anti-Christian culture which would destroy the Christian beliefs and convictions in the vast majority of the people so they would embrace the ideas of Marxism and they would embrace the ideas that they had rejected and they would be open to a takeover basically by Marxists. Now not political Marxists but cultural Marxists. Rather than workers uniting and marching into battle thus seizing power through force they would make a long march through the institutions. Institutions like the arts, cinema, theater, literature, schools, college, seminaries, newspapers, magazines, and what is now known as radio, TV, and the mass media. Once this march is over, all the barriers to the acceptance of Marxism will have been quietly and systematically removed. So to get to that point, they said we have to destroy the culture and what they were talking about was the Christian culture, uh, what we used to call Christendom or Western civilization. If you can break people away from religious affinities, for example, where they would turn to their community, their religious community for support and help, or they would turn to scripture for answers to certain perplexing questions. If they have an affinity to their religion, they might say, well, we're not going to go along with government because it's contrary to my religion. So cultural Marxism would attack religion of all kinds. doesn't make any difference because there was another place where people could go other than to the government for support and for answers. We the people will have thus been indoctrinated or brainwashed into seeing the wisdom of Marxism and the folly of capitalism. Thus, the door to socialism and communism will be open, and the door to a constitutional republic closed. Because the success of cultural Marxism means the demise of the U.S. Constitution. The Constitution is a set of principles. It's based ultimately on a moral code because you go back to the Declaration of Independence. What was the basis for the Declaration of Independence? The law of nature and of nature's God, right? The ultimate moral code. Uh, but if you don't follow those principles, if you try, as the expression goes, shave a point off here and there uh, to make a buck or to be reelected or for your special interest group to get some kind of a government subsidy, then the consequences are going to be in the long run deleterious to society as a whole and there's the difficulty. There are too many people that are thinking in the short term and not applying these principles which are designed to give us a long term stability to this system. Let's back up a moment. How did cultural Marxism get into the United States? Some brief history. In 1923, members of the Marxist Communist Party set up an institute at Frankfurt University in Germany. This institute was named the Institute for Social Research. Later, it would become known as simply the Frankfurt School. These new Marxists, under the direction of Max Horkheimer, had seen the old Lenin Marxists fail. The workers of the world did not unite in World War I. Further, they realized why. Antonio Gramsci, the disciple who wrote the prison notebooks, had it right. Marxism could only flourish after a long march through the cultural institutions. Now the mantra would be, change Western culture and then the workers will unite. After Marx, there were a group of Marxists who wisely decided that you could bring 
this collectivist society to a nation through culture as well by introducing certain values and concepts that would break down the family, for example. If you could somehow break down the family unit so that it was no longer self-sustaining and no longer valued in a society, then that would leave individual members who formerly could turn to the family for support in times of need. They would now be cut loose. They would be without a place to go in times of need. So now they have to turn to the government. But just as the march through the institutions was about to begin, an anti-Marxist, anti-Semitic Adolf Hitler ascended to power and World War II began. Since the leading lights of the Frankfurt School were Marxist, the school packed up its ideology and fled to America, settling down in New York City with the support of Columbia University. Now, if you ever wanted to really piss off Andrew Jackson, all he had to do was mention Rachel's name in vain, and he would challenge you to a duel. But what exactly is the march? And who was marching? What values has the long march through the institutions rolled over? How have Americans been affected? Let's hear it from some of the Frankfurt School graduates themselves, like George Lukacs, Antonio Gramsci, Charles Reich, Herbert Marcuse, Theodore Adorno, Eric Fromm, Wilhelm Reich, and Max Horkheimer. Marx got it all wrong. The workers are not up to being the vanguard of the communist revolution. Let's translate Marxism into cultural terms. And Herbert Marcuse. The West is guilty of genocidal crimes against every civilization and culture it has encountered. America and Western civilization are the world's greatest repositories of racism, sexism, nativism, Xenophobia, anti-Semitism, fascism, and Nazism. American society is oppressive, evil, and undeserving of loyalty. Have you ever heard of cultural Marxism? If so, what is it? Um, I'm not familiar completely with Marxism. I have not heard of cultural Marxism. Cultural I mean, Marxism? Um, no, I don't even think I know what it is. That, that kind of talk is gibberish to me. I hate <laughs> okay. To tell you. It's used in, in, in some terms, I think, as a, sort of a, uh, the thing that uh, is almost politically correct from a, Marxist, from a Marxist standpoint, in other words, from a socialist or communist standpoint. George Lukacs. I see the revolutionary destruction of society as the one and only solution. A worldwide overturning of values cannot take place without the annihilation of the old values, the creation of the new ones by the revolution. Lukacs' gift to America later became known as cultural terrorism. Gifts such as radical sex education in public schools covering such subjects as free love, outdatedness of monogamy, irrelevance of religion, and the archaic nature of the middle-class family. Women were called upon to rebel against the sexual mores of the day, such being the core values of Christianity and Western culture. His ideas later became the basis for the sexual revolution, embraced by a generation of drug-challenged baby boomers. When you hear people say, as I did on the campaigns, Pat, what happened to the country we grew up in? Physically, it's the same country, but they're right. We're in another country now. And this is why I think the cultural Marxists have prevailed and are prevailing. They have captured the young. Uh, what was the saying in the um, Abby Hoffman, we're going to capture your children? In a lot of ways, they did. 
Although Gromsky died in 1937, his prison notebooks lived on as the blueprints to de-Christianize the West. The civilized world has been thoroughly saturated with Christianity for 2,000 years. Any country grounded in Judeo-Christian values cannot, therefore, be overthrown until those roots are cut. But to cut the roots, to change culture, a long march through the institutions is necessary. Only then will power fall into our laps like a ripened fruit. And the new generation of freedom-loving, authority-challenged baby boomers were quite willing to accept the bait and take a toke. Turn on, tune in, drop out. Yes, our prison planner, Antonio Gramsci, had quite a dream. The only way a Marxist revolution could be successful was if the heat shield of capitalism, Christianity, were first destroyed. Charles Reich. There is a revolution coming. It will not be like revolutions of the past. It will originate with the individual, with culture, and it will change the political structure only as its final act. Reich thus helped shape the minds of the American 60s youth with his runaway best-selling book, The Greening of America. Gramsci and Marx were now reaching their target audience, and the long march was in progress. In the 1960s, the church pulled back from the culture. You had the first Sex and Satanism film. You had the first X-rated film, where the pastor takes the boy up to his room in Broadway to get on his knees but not to pray. Uh, you had uh, all of the perversion. You went from 100% broad audience films that anybody could see uh, to 82% R-rated movies, which were restricted. Uh, you had a tremendous uh, loss of viewership of the movie theaters. Even though television had been around for 20 years, it went from 44 million weekly attendance to 17 million weekly attendance. And so basically what happened, the church gave up in the mid-60s. It came up on prayer in schools. It gave up on being a, a force in society. And Johnson uh, shackled the church uh, when he uh, said that uh, when he used the 501c3, to say the churches couldn't talk about politics and the church just buckled under. When prayer was taken out of school, the church buckled under. When the church collapsed from Hollywood, uh, they buckled under. So it was the church's internal collapse, and that has happened before in history, and unless people get revival, reformation, renewal, we will never reclaim the culture. So cultural Marxism would be that type of activity in any society that breaks down the culture in such a way so that people instinctively turn to government as an alternative for the support that they otherwise would have. This is done through art, and through music, it's through literature, it's through motion pictures and that kind of thing. The implanting of certain ideas and concepts which make them very ripe for the philosophy of collectivism and makes them very ripe for turning to government as the big daddy, the big solver of all problems. As Hudson Institute scholar John Fonte wrote, Max Horkheimer and Gromsky believe that there are no absolute moral standards that are universally true for all human beings outside a particular historical context. In other words, to the Frankfurt School, values come from society or the state collective. Same? Yes. That's relativism. Collectivism implies that if something is important enough, then the state should step in and make sure that everybody conforms, whether they want to or not. So the essence of collectivism in a political sense is that it employs the use of coercion to require people to work together. And once coercion enters, then you are actually participating in a negative social conduct, which is in many cases worse than the uh, social condition that you're trying to overcome by the collective action. People are not given free will. They're required to do this and that because uh, the majority has decided this is for the greater good of the greater number and so forth. Whereas individualism uh, works toward the same goals, but they do so in the environment of freedom. So it's the difference between freedom and coercion.
Not to be outdone by Karl Marx, a brilliant mind or two at the Frankfurt School soon came up with several of their own ideas, the foremost known as critical theory. The idea behind critical theory is to challenge all previously accepted standards in every aspect of life from a Marxist perspective. Standards such as Abe Lincoln was honest, home is where the heart is, democracy and capitalism are good, the founders believed in freedom. In doing this, every negative thing one could possibly say about America was dredged up, circulated in books, movies, TV, schools, colleges, and even the clergy, so that the youth would be endlessly indoctrinated. Things like white men killed the Indians, fathers were repressive, God is dead, the founders had slaves. They did have a problem, which was that although slavery was technically legal throughout all the colonies, only some of the colonies really had slave-based economies, the southern states, Maryland, south, essentially. And therefore, they had to deal with the practical problem of how could you integrate these states with the northern and middle colonies, middle states and northern states, in a way that would, as much as possible, unify them. So they had to make some kind of initial political compromises with the social institutions that existed in the southern states. But there was a mindset at the time that slavery would essentially wither away because it was not a practical economic concern in the long run. But it certainly was not a matter that could be criticized from the point of view of, of principle. Uh, you know, the first principle in the preamble is to create a more perfect union. That was their first goal. But when the consciousness challenged baby boomers repeatedly heard that the establishment, as they came to refer to it, was a bunch of racist, overly religious, sexually deprived sexists who were xenophobic Indian killers and anti-Semites, they internalized the criticisms. Soon their movies and songs began to reflect these values, spreading them throughout the nation's youth culture. Critical theory was doing its job, especially on people like Charles Manson and John Lennon. Even though the reality-challenged baby boomers of the 1960s were the most free, most affluent, and most privileged of any youth in any age, they were bored with their lives and swallowed the Frankfurt School's propaganda like a hit of California sunshine. Books like The Death of the Family, Escape from Freedom, the mass psychology of fascism, the sexual revolution, the joy of sex, and the authoritarian personality flew off the shelves. Counterculture drug movies like The Trip, Easy Rider, The Wild Angels, The Wild Bunch, and Born Loser played theaters endlessly. Books like Authoritarian Personality were particular hits because they attacked the patriarchal family unit a deeply Christian institution. So along came movies depicting the family unit as sexually repressed and dysfunctional. Movies like Battle of the Sexes, How to Handle Your Wife, Harold and Maude, The Graduate, Bonnie and Clyde, Carnal Knowledge, Bob and Ted and Carol and Alice, Boys in the Band, The Godfather, and Kramer vs. Kramer instilled cultural pessimism about families. Uh, the basic unit of a family is where a male uh, as a sex uh, joins with a female as a sex and they're able to work together to help each other and by being able to work together to help each other they perfect each other, they love each other, they care for each other and in the process they learn to love and perfect and care for others within the society. They become good citizens because they're good citizens within their own home and that produces a society that loves each other. It's, marriage is a particularly Judeo-Christian institution. It, it was Jesus who instituted uh, one man and one wife uh, forever shall become one flesh. By targeting the family unit, the cultural Marxists knew they could eventually destroy the middle class of the United States. Why? Because the family unit is the basic building block of the middle class destroy the middle class and you eventually destroy the economic engine of the United States. Destroy the economic engine of the US and its political structure 
built on capitalism and the Constitution, crumbles. Uh, I just recently um, had, had some shares stolen from me on the stock market by our government, who, who seized 80 percent of uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac shares. I'm like, how, how could this happen? And they, they seized, um, you know, private property. The whole point of a socialistic society is to do four things. Marx talks about destroying the family, two, destroying property, three, destroying religion, and four, destroying the nation. And what you end up with is the gulag, where the whole country becomes the Soviet Union. Yes, critical theory is diabolical genius. The cultural Marxist could accomplish what Marx, Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin only dreamed of accomplishing. Whereas Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin took Marx's ideas and delivered the brutal Soviet Union to the world, Gramsci, Lukacs, and Marcuse took Marx's ideas and delivered user-friendly cultural Marxism to America. The Supreme Court has been converted into a fighting ally of secularism in the wars against traditionalism in the United States. The Supreme Court has perverted the Constitution. It has usurped power that belongs to the states and imposed secular views and values on the states and on the communities, making decisions that used to be made democratically at the local level. This time, it seems, Marx won. Today, post-Angle, politically correct baby boomers are so completely immersed in the Frankfurt School's cultural pessimism, they can't see the forest for the trees. They're fish in a bowl of muddy water. They're Neo in the Matrix. They swim in it. They absorb it through every pore of their beingness. Starting in the 1960s, cultural Marxism has woven its values into every American's very existence. Khrushchev was right when he said, we will bury you. The nefarious genius of cultural Marxist strategy is to destroy the family unit by promoting what's known in the field of botany as androgyny. From the American College Dictionary, androgyny means, quote, having staminate and pistillate flowers in the same inflorescence, being both male and female, hermaphroditic, end quote. Translated into cultural Marxist strategy, this means making the father and mother of a family the same and or reversing their roles. How is this done? Well, it starts with invalidation. I hate this house and I don't want to be here anymore. As previously discussed, one of the key technologies of the Frankfurt School is critical theory. Recall the purpose of critical theory is to instill cultural pessimism. Thus, by endlessly portraying fathers as dominant, restrictive, depersonalized, and controlling, the cultural Marxist is able to invalidate the male component of the family unit. Concomitant with this, by endlessly portraying mothers as schizophrenic, nagging, anxious, the cultural Marxist is able to invalidate the female component of the family unit. This two-punch invalidation, endlessly repeated in the general literature, movies, and media, gives rise to a pessimistic attitude towards the traditional family. After time, this pessimism becomes imbued into the culture. That's why it's said the product of critical theory is cultural pessimism. The message of cultural pessimism. One, families are boring, stifling, and intrusive. Two, mothers and fathers suck. Three, divorce is therefore understandable and justified. With divorce made understandable and justified, 
even laughingly made easy by calling it no fault, one out of two nuclear families now disintegrate into chaos. Most contracts, the court system tries to sustain the contract. If you and I are doing business together and uh, they're trying to protect that contract because the contract was entered into in good faith for good principles. However, although the marriage might have been entered into in good faith, by breaking that they can put a lot of people to work. Not only the uh, the marital courts can go to work, they're also the social workers that go to work. There's also a whole team of people, including the IRS, who prey off of them. And one court in Massachusetts says, we're going to bring this father to his knees and take all of his money from him. So there's a whole movement by the courts to make money off the dissolution of marriage. After the mother and the father are finally done arguing or negotiating over custody of the children and possession of the assets, two new family homes are usually established. He lives here and she lives there. Each new household economy now has to have a redundant, otherwise superfluous set of rent or mortgage payments, energy and utility demands, and household furnishings and accoutrements. Extensive and complex scheduling of child visitation then must be established. If the divorce was acrimonious and or the children were traumatized by it, and most are, both parents vie for the children's attention and visitation. As they do this, knowingly or unknowingly, they spoil the children with unending material gifts, junk food, sugar, unearned validation, and parental supervision so lenient it borders on gross negligence. Divorce is a dreadful for children and now you have uh, some families probably the weakest and the and the poorest mostly black families that are now over uh, 50 and even 60 percent in divorce which is critical uh, for the children. But worst of all children are usually shipped off to daycare centers and or public schools where they are then handled like animals in captivity. Now we're talking about a uh, a school system that's teaching values that's determined not by the, by the parents, not even by the teachers, but by the political uh, groups that provide the funding, the politicians, the bureaucrats, the, the uh, think tanks, all the, these invisible uh, structures above. Now, those are the people who are determining the values that are being taught in our schools. The profligate cultural Marxist society that causes and tolerates this then imposes pharmaceutical drugs on these children. Certainly the arts have always had a tendency uh, to promote license instead of liberty. The difference between license means that I can do anything if it's, even if it's destructive uh, of other people and, and of myself. I can take drugs until I OD, I can uh, hurt other people uh, and hurt their children and families. Uh, license is something that is selfishness rules. With liberty, what rules is the freedom to be responsible, the freedom to live a decent life, the freedom to love others, the freedom to give. It's like the difference between love and lust. And unfortunately, often the principle of love is replaced in the media with the principle of lust. And the lust principle produces media that's constantly uh, pushing the envelope. Almost every movie that Hollywood puts out today must depict characters with at least one of the following attributes. One, the protagonist and or the antagonist are divorced. Two, the female is portrayed as dominant, controlling, violent, and or one up on men. Three, the male is portrayed as aloof, feminine, overly sensitive, and or cheating. Four, somewhere in the family, at least one of its immediate members must be a lesbian, gay, bisexual, or a women's liver. Often, attributes are mixed in various proportions, and even mixed with a touch of schizophrenia, as males and females swap roles in fluorescence. Same-sex marriage does not give you the balance of having a mother and a father so that you can learn different skills from them and you learn different personality types from them. By abolishing that, children are adrift. 
through endless repetition and media dissemination, androgynous elements are institutionalized as legitimate and eventually normal. Cultural pessimism has been taken to a whole new level. Complete tolerance for dysfunctional social structures and inefficient economic units. Proof that Christian values do not work. Schools should be completely operated uh, by parents. They should be in control and therefore the parents can determine what values are taught to the students. If the, if the school doesn't teach the values that that parent wants taught to their children, then they can take the child out of that school and put him in another school which does teach those values. The Supreme Court has been converted into a fighting ally of secularism in the wars against traditionalism in the United States. With the success of cultural Marxism, hundreds of millions of nuclear families have been destroyed since 1965. This has contributed to, or caused, the decline of the middle class. Next will be the destruction of American capitalism, unless the effects of cultural Marxism are recognized and handled. There is a revolution coming. It will not be like revolutions of the past. It will originate with the individual and with culture and it will change the political structure only as its final act. It's evident today that corporations raise and spend huge amounts of money on the political campaigns of presidents and congressmen. These corporations also spend huge amounts of money hiring former government officials to lobby Congress to pass laws that mainly benefit their interests. If so, have we allowed entities other than people to monopolize government? The Founding Fathers were very concerned about the use of political power to benefit special interest groups, what they call factions. Small segments of society that had their own selfish concerns that didn't relate to the benefit of others. So they wanted as much as possible to restrain the ability of the general government to engage in that kind of behavior. The system that we have today of interventionism serves the interests of, of the lobbyists and they represent the uh, international corporations because they have influence and they say what we need is lobbying reform to keep the lobbyists from lobbying. That is not the answer because lobbying is just petitioning the government. We have a right to do that. What we have to do, there's two answers to that. One, if you had the right people in Washington, the right members of Congress who would not yield to the temptation of being influenced by money the whole program would, it would cease. They wouldn't have any more influence. But that doesn't seem to happen. The real solution is getting the government out of the business of being able to pass out favors so there's no incentive for the businessman to come and lobby the member of Congress. Have we allowed corporate power to influence the creation of laws that fail to benefit the people? Are we allowing corporations to reconfigure the laws of this nation to suit their purposes at the expense of real people? Do you feel special interests have hijacked Congress? I don't. No, I think they've got a valuable part to play because they are uh, experts in their area and they can provide some good, uh, good guidance for, for the congressmen who aren't specialists in these areas. Lawyers will argue that indeed corporations are people. They will argue that they are even good corporate citizens. But is a corporation really a citizen? Or for that matter, even a person? And what about a multinational corporation? Is that even a citizen of the United States? There's no doubt in my mind that the political apparatus of the United States government is much more beholden to the powerful lobbying interests, the companies that can write those big fat checks, campaign contributions and that sort of thing. Uh, you can see it every day. The politicians will give speeches, very good speeches in some cases, saying all the things that the voters want to hear. But then when it comes time to vote on an issue, they quite often will go directly opposite to what they said, and they will vote in favor of the positions that the corporations want.
and the lobbyists want. Did the Founding Fathers write the Constitution for real flesh and blood people or for corporations, artificial entities that are creations of the state? If one suspects the Constitution was written with real people in mind, then is it fair to those real people that artificial people get to write and influence the passage of all manner of laws and expect these laws to be binding upon those same real flesh and blood people? Public officials have become less concerned with what people want or with what Americans, the common American thinks. What's the uh, solution? Well, what kind of a government is this? It's a go self-government. Right, Self-government is not a spectator sport. If people don't participate in it, either running for office themselves or becoming involved with uh, political campaigns or becoming in involved with public education on issues, well, then you're going to leave by default control in the hands of the small number of people who do those things. And the smaller that group becomes and the more they see that the general population is really uh, disinterested or even impotent in uh, political affairs, the more they will tend to think, well, we can run things our own way. We don't have to remain in touch with the people because they don't count. Just as Marxism called for workers of the world to unite, a different totalitarian ideology calls for corporations of the world to unite. Not only unite with each other, consolidation, but unite with governments, with states. Thus, when corporations unite with the state, it is known as fascism. So, what is the difference between a socialist state and a fascist state? If you go far enough to the right, you get fascism. If you go far enough to the left, you get Marxism. Fascism develops when the state initiates the merger of corporate power with state power, as what happened in Nazi Germany and Mussolini's Italy. The key words being merge and power. Fascism is thus not a merger of the state and corporations per se, it's a merger of their power. Secondly, it's the merged power that governs, not either the state or the corporations per se. Today, however, with multinational corporations growing into entities, some larger than states, we have emerging a totally unprecedented form of fascism, what could be called corporate fascism. Have you ever heard of corporate fascism? If so, what is it? I'm not familiar with that term specifically. I could take a guess at it, where I assume that it, it, it reflects on the, the amount of money that's available for large, large corporations to support lobbying and have an influence on what laws are passed and not passed. Under corporate fascism, corporations are so huge that they have the financial ability to initiate powerful lobbying influences over governments, even the Congress and Presidency of the United States. Thus, even though such multinationals and the U.S. states are able to remain distinct, again, it's their merged power that increasingly supersedes the will of we the people. Have you ever heard of corporate fascism? If so, what is it? Um, I've read about it on CNN. I don't know if I can actually define it. If I had to say corporate fascism is probably just greed, corporate greed, and just hypocrisy. To understand what socialism is, one must first understand what communism is. Communism is an economic system whereby the state owns the means of production. Means of production meaning capital. Capital meaning money, machinery, labor, land, and resources. Socialism is an economic system whereby the state owns the fruits of production. Fruits of production meaning revenues generated by the means. Revenues generated by the means is another way of saying taxes. 
extreme of socialism was uh, the Soviet system, communism. So there was no pricing structure, and it's a failed system. It can't work because prices are so important. So communism owns and confiscates the means and fruits of production, whereas socialism confiscates just the fruits of production in the form of excessive taxes. Socialist states in Europe, for instance, confiscate as much as 50% of the money citizens pay for retail products and services. This is the outrageous sales tax a socialist state demands. We interfere a lot, but we allow prices to adjust in the marketplace for the most part. But when it comes to interest rates, the Federal Reserve is always deciding the central plans through the control of money and interest rates, how much money we should have in circulation and should we shrink the money supply, expand the money supply. And that's a form of socialism, but it's only half of socialism because it's controlling only half of the transaction and that's money but it's it's very dangerous and leads to an authoritarian approach because it eventually breaks down and I think that's what we're witnessing today thus a socialist state rapes the people mainly through excessive taxes a fascist state rapes the people mainly through excessive debt both ultimately rape the people through taxes because debt causes inflation, a hidden tax. Debt causes inflation because the Federal Reserve System facilitates the conversion of government bonds, government IOUs, into Federal Reserve notes, what we use as a currency. Well, the Federal Reserve, in its very nature, is contrary to a free market. The Federal Reserve is not only regulating, but it's manipulating the marketplace against the will of uh, the people who are conducting the marketplace. When this is done, the money supply is inflated. When the money supply is inflated, it becomes watered down or diluted. Just like stock, when a corporation authorizes and issues more stock, existing shareholders are diluted. When money is diluted, it has less purchasing power. When it has less purchasing power, prices rise, because it takes more Federal Reserve notes to purchase a given product. When prices rise, it has the effect of a tax. Inflation is therefore a hidden tax. If the government can create new money that it doesn't have to tax for, and especially if it can put off the ultimate payment of this into the future through the use of long-term bonds that are the back backing for the fiat currency, then we have a government that is essentially uh, out of control to some degree. It can make decisions that are not immediately going to subject the people to pressure. Thus, corporate fascism uses debt, which generates the hidden tax of inflation, and cultural Marxism uses endless taxes to fund its socialist operations and expansion. Unfortunately, the constitutional republic envisioned by the founders is being undermined by both cultural Marxism and corporate fascism. And to blame our problems exclusively on either the left or the right, liberals or conservatives, Democrats or Republicans, is foolish. Again, both cultural Marxism, an ultra-liberal ideology, and corporate fascism are undermining the U.S. Constitution and destroying the republic envisioned by the founders. As we have seen, the Constitution gives Congress the power and the responsibility to provide for the general welfare of the nation. So important is the idea of general welfare, this is the only term that is stated twice in the Constitution, once in the preamble and again in Article I. Unfortunately, a lot of people interpret this term to be a green light for massive social security the so-called nanny state, which pays for everything and then demands the right to regulate everything. 
where the Constitution was written to limit the size and scope of government. It was to uh, recognize that government was there to protect our liberties. It does not endorse the welfare system at all. If we just followed the Constitution, the government would be very much smaller, maybe 80 percent smaller. This may be the cultural Marxist dream of a socialist state. But as a result, we now have minimum wage laws, child labor laws, federal disability laws, Medicaid laws, public housing laws, rent laws, entitlement laws, food stamp laws, and even extensive pet laws. Over 25,000 laws are enacted every year. Many by congressmen that have been bought and paid for by multinational corporations, all non-people entities. I hereby declare this to be an unlawful assembly. If you remain in this immediate vicinity, you will be in violation of the Pennsylvania Crimes Code, no matter what your purpose is. What comes to mind is big corporations that put their view of the world out there for everyone, um, take over small businesses, take over um, choices that people might have, different kinds of products where everything becomes much more generic and just based on cost as opposed to quality and workmanship. Because term limits have not been established for the Congress, most congressmen have been able to stay in office for decades. Again, this is the Supreme Court. States were enacting and imposed term limits on their members of Congress uh, in something like half the American states, and the Supreme Court overthrew it and took the right away from the states to impose term limits on their own members of Congress. And what did Congress do? They said, that's fine with us, because we'll stay in power. It seems the more a congressman is entrenched, the more he is able to build a social network, a network of cronies. Clearly, good relationships with fellow congressmen serve many productive purposes, but such a network can also be abused. After all, it's much easier to minimize the risks of vote swapping, a form of collusion, amongst cronies. It's much easier to justify corporate campaign contributions, a form of bribery, amongst cronies. And it's much easier to get away with earmarks, a form of fraud, amongst cronies. Thus, an entrenched Congress, especially one cast into only two major political parties, would seem to be in the perfect position to imperceptibly usurp power from the people and place it into the hands of the corporate fascists that have hijacked Congress. The right place to look for a solution to the problem of corrupt politicians is at the voter and their perception of who they're voting for and what the political principles of their candidates are. You can bet collusion, bribery, and fraud are not practices the founders envisioned for a more perfect union. So unless I have this view that I need to participate in this system as a self-governing citizen to maintain the integrity of the system, the system will eventually be dominated from the top down by the people who can actually make something from gaming it, as the expression goes. So uh, this is the Founding Fathers' point. It depends upon having a virtuous citizenry that is willing to shoulder the burdens of maintaining a self-governmental structure. Again, general welfare includes everyone, especially the vast majority of average citizens who fall within the middle of the social spectrum. In statistical terms, the average or mean is represented at the top or crest of what's known as a bell-shaped curve. It's the middle of the bell-shaped curve. So it's fair to say that the original intent of the Constitution is to define a government that serves the general population, the middle of the bell-shaped curve, now known as the middle class. Do you sense a dwindling middle class or a wealth disparity? Well, I think things are changing right now. I think the last, uh, the last eight years have been uh, 
uh, increasing, increasing wealth disparity. But I think some of the excesses of those days uh, may be over. The terms spreading the wealth, redistribution, and wealth disparity are meaningless in an America that truly responds to the original intent of the Constitution. The proper function of government is not to provide, but to protect. Because if you're going to provide for some, you must have the authority and the power to take from others. And once you're in that business of taking from some and giving to others, now you're in the business of redividing the wealth. And that gives you tremendous power over, over the citizenry. And it always leads to abuse of power and eventually to totalitarian regimes. Many have commented that we now have a monstrous tax system, a system that taxes its citizens far more than citizens of the Boston Tea Party era. If two to three percent taxation justified a revolution in 1776, why doesn't 50 percent and growing justify a revolution? If a few little excise taxes on pieces of paper and tea justified open lawlessness from these rebels that we're all celebrating, why don't the myriad of incomprehensible, unavoidable, crushing taxes, state, local, and federal, why don't they justify a revolution today? Our government not only taxes us at every transaction, it's in our faces at every turn endlessly regulating what we can and cannot do. All these regulating laws and their expensive enforcement programs are turning us into a police state. policemen of the world, so instead of a government now that uh, occupies so many other countries and we have 700 bases overseas, that wouldn't happen if we had the proper size government. Over 50 percent of U.S. citizens now work for the government at either the federal, state, or local level. Obey your orders! Understand the orders you are taking right now are unconstitutional. Yes. Understand right now what you guys are doing here today will play effect throughout history. Before the Romans crashed and burned, they had gone down the same road, only they called their social security bread and circuses. Bread and circuses will eventually crash the U.S. empire as well, if we interpret the term general welfare in the Constitution as an invitation for social security. General is the problem. What did the founding fathers intend when they wrote those words. General welfare has been debated since the Constitution itself. Uh, many of the founders were concerned that the general welfare would be taken in the wrong sense, that it would be used to apply for, as we've done it today, as Hamilton wanted us to do it, to give the government license to do whatever it wanted and just to grab power. The founders knew that Rome and every society since the beginning of time had poor, sick, and unfortunate, and many of these societies tried to help. For instance, in 1597, England had the Elizabethan Poor Laws enacted to provide what were known as the Seven Corporeal Works of Mercy. These works were to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, 
attend the sick, visit the prisoner, and bury the dead. But is this how you really promote the general welfare, the founders asked? You're talking to someone about a free society, and they say to you, as they always do, what about the poor? Oh, the poor? What are we going to do about the poor if there's no welfare state? The poor, the die in the streets, and isn't that, right? A perfectly valid objection, and we all generally have this tendency, what do we do? We, we run out and we research, and we go, we become the human Wikipedia talking point planet of infinite facts, and we try and give everybody statistics, and we give everybody historical examples, and we say, well, there was these friendly societies in the 1920s, and uh, the fact that I find useful is uh, the number of poor people that after the Second World War was declining 1% a year because of the free market when the welfare state came in. It stopped declining and stayed steady, which is exactly what you would expect. And if you subsidize something, you increase its prevalence, and you subsidize poverty, you get more. Give a man a fish, and you feed him for a day. Teach him how to fish, and you feed him for life. The founders were teachers. Their original intent was to set up a system that created fishermen. The Constitution means what means what the founders intended it to mean. Otherwise, it means nothing. If, if, you, if you want to have the Constitution mean what modern politicians think it should mean, then you don't need a Constitution. In fact, you're better off without one. Just say, what do the modern politicians want us to do today? What would happen if you created a society that could actually rise above problems? A society where the government gently facilitated a free and prosperous citizenry. A citizenry so successful, there were no hungry. There were no sick or poor. There were no criminals. You could take the Department of Education, the Department of Housing, and any number of these national departments and defund them to zero and send out the funds to the states and block grants which would eventually go down to zero and get rid of most of the federal government. The federal government still has a responsibility of national defense. The Justice Department is needed, the State Department is needed, the Treasury Department are needed, but many of those other departments should be defunded rather than have the politics of the federal government imposed upon the nation. The founders wanted to set people free from the system, or the matrix. That's what liberty is all about. They wanted general welfare to be the result of a self-governing, productive society. They wanted general welfare, not welfare in general. One of the earliest examples of corporate fascism can be found in the current U.S. banking system. This system, known as the Federal Reserve System, or FED, is a quasi-private, government-sanctioned banking cartel, little different from OPEC or any other cartel. Just as OPEC dictates the amount and price of oil, the Federal Reserve dictates the amount and price of money. Hardly what one could call free enterprise capitalism. Federal Reserve, in its very nature, is contrary to a free market. The Federal Reserve is not only regulating, but it's manipulating the marketplace against the will of uh, the people who are conducting the marketplace. So the Federal Reserve is, uh, is a, a drain and also a, um, a detriment uh, to a free market system. By setting interest rates and determining the amount of money in circulation, the Federal Reserve epitomizes regulation of what's supposed to be a free market capitalist society. This cartel presents the illusion of working for the general welfare, but in reality, it always acts in the best interests of not only itself, but its prime lenders and borrowers, the U.S. government, the major New York banks, and the multinational corporations. With this unlimited balance sheet, the Fed can effectively create as much money as it wants to satisfy Congress's wayward spending habits. This money, known as legal tender, 
is money not backed by gold, but created by mere government fiat, and now mandated as payment for all debts, public and private. Known as fiat currency, this so-called money is regulated not by the free market, but by a Federal Reserve Open Market Committee that deliberates in secrecy. It is the Federal Reserve System that is at the heart of endless bailouts and the too big to fail syndrome. A system that creates endless amounts of money that fuels wars and the fascist globalist agenda by basically two mechanisms, monetizing debt and fractional reserve. The gold and silver standard the United States had uh, was an enormous blessing for this country. Today, the U.S. currency is backed by nothing but debt in the form of U.S. bonds. This is known as monetizing debt, the act of converting debt into money. Debt causes inflation because the Federal Reserve System facilitates the conversion of government bonds, government IOUs, into Federal Reserve notes, what we use as a currency. When this is done, the money supply is inflated. When the money supply is inflated, it becomes watered down or diluted. Just like stock, when a corporation authorizes and issues more stock, existing shareholders are diluted. When money is diluted, it has less purchasing power. When it has less purchasing power, prices rise because it takes more Federal Reserve notes to purchase a given product. When prices rise, it has the effect of a tax. Inflation is therefore a hidden tax. If you can delay the payment and hide the payment, that is, borrow money or print money, uh, those who really pay the price are hard to find. They're usually the poor people in the middle class. So it's, it's a very uh, specific plan to have a central bank to destroy money. It's been done for thousands of years. They used to dilute the metals or clip the coins or uh, even in the old days they tried printing money. Today we do it with a computer. Thus, corporate fascism uses debt, which generates the hidden tax of inflation, and cultural Marxism uses endless taxes to fund its socialist operations and expansion. Unfortunately, the constitutional republic envisioned by the founders is being undermined by both cultural Marxism and corporate fascism. And to blame our problems exclusively on either the left or the right, liberals or conservatives, Democrats or Republicans, is foolish. Again, both cultural Marxism and corporate fascism are undermining the U.S. Constitution and destroying the republic envisioned by the founders. As far as fractional reserve banking is concerned, that's a problem of fraud. That is, fractional reserve banking is where the bank generates more paper currency than it has, say, gold and silver reserves on a, on a species standard. And it can really generate as much paper currency as the market is willing to bear, as long as the market has some credence that the bank will pay. And what tends to happen is that the banks overexpand. Uh, they play too many of those cards, and at a certain stage, the market says, no, there's too much money out here in terms of real resources, and you get what's called a bank run. People come back to the banks and will make good on these promises. The banks can't do it. You have recession, depression, what have you. The whole credit structure drops. Now, if that kind of a system were fully disclosed and everyone knew how it was working, my anticipation is that there would be very few fractional reserve banks. The framers of the Constitution were quite aware of the liabilities of bills of credit and fractional reserve banking. And this is why Article I states, no state shall make any thing but gold and silver a tender in the payment of debts. And, quote, no state shall emit bills of credit. The Federal Reserve System should be abolished. It was not authorized in the Constitution, therefore we shouldn't have it. 
But I take a sort of a moderate approach to doing it because there's a lot of people who depend on the system today and I wouldn't close it down in one day, but I would legalize competition, allow gold and silver to circulate as money, take taxes off gold and silver so you didn't have to pay sales taxes or capital gains taxes and let the people transition over to gold and silver. Since 1976, we weren't even allowed to own gold. And then later on, we got the American Gold Eagle. So we're, we're moving in that direction. Uh, but we need to go a little bit further to legalize uh, contracts in gold. The real culprit is the ability of the Fed to monetize debt. Members of Congress spend money for war and welfare. They can't borrow enough and they can't tax enough, so they literally create treasury bills out of thin air, and then the Federal Reserve creates money out of thin airs and buys the treasury bills, and that has to eventually destroy the value of the dollar. If we were to abolish the Federal Reserve System tomorrow and get the banks out of it completely, turn the entire function as it now operates over to the Treasury, nothing would change. The same people would still dominate the system from behind the scenes. So this question of ownership receives too much attention because where that idea goes is that, well, if we can just find out who owns these banks, and if we don't like who they are, then we can uh, support a move to abolish the Federal Reserve and turn that system over to the Treasury, exactly as it's now operating. So the focus should not be on who owns the banks, but on what the banks are doing. If the public better understood how fiat money can be abused by Congress, it would impeach almost every member and abolish the Federal Reserve Central Bank, as it has done twice in the nation's history. Thank you. 